Eventually, most little businesses, they get set up with this kind of structure. Someone's in sales and marketing, someone's in admin, and someone's in technical delivery. Um, so you've got a power planner, you've got an admin person, you've got someone who's actually client facing, and that's the normal structure, would you agree? And you might have two or three people in each role and you get up to nine or 10 people and you start to struggle and all that sort of stuff. So the key role that I want to introduce you to is the role that makes all the difference. And that is that you actually want to introduce a role called the key person of influence. And the key person of influence is the person who's out there market facing, but kind of influencing in the marketplace. And actually they evangelize the vision of, of your firm. Whereas you've got a team who then functionally um, do sales, admin and technical delivery. And that's, that's the key thing that you'll see in companies that make a lot of money and are really successful. They've got this extra role called the key person of influence. The key person of influence doesn't have a desk in the office because where you want them is out speaking, talking to the media, um, hosting workshops, you know, uh, writing books, writing for uh, different um, publications, recording a podcast, all of those kind of things. So I'm going to talk you through what a key person of influence does. Essentially, they do five things. They pitch, they publish, they productize, they raise profile, and they do partnerships. So pitching, really important. Financial planning is about pitching a vision. Would you agree? That you've got to, these days, you've, if you're going to compete with the basics of financial planning, you have to be in a, in a good position to pitch a vision um, to someone else or pitch something, a value add, to, to create some sort of an idea in the marketplace that people say, actually, to hell with the app, I want to go and you know, get my hands around this particular idea. So we've got to get good at pitching. And they don't teach us pitching in school, and most people suck at it. Um, so when I go and ask people, what do you do, here's the typical answers that I will get at a conference. Um, so this one's fun. I'm a bit all over the place at the moment. I wear multiple hats. Uh, I'm doing several things in the financial planning space, and some of it's my passion, but I also work on my side hustle uh, and I'm looking into my options. Wow, great pitch, okay. Uh, this one, what do you do? Well, I started out selling printing equipment in the 80s and that led me to an interesting role in research with a PLC in the early 90s. I ended up doing a year in Bristol and then I moved to Stoke-on-Trent in 1992. Then in 2002, oh my goodness, why did I ask? Um, this one, what do you do? I'm a financial planner. I bet you've heard that before. Everyone's doing financial planning these days. I'm actually finding it a bit hard to get clients at the moment. Are you getting many clients? Maybe Brexit's scaring people off, right? So here's the rules that combat those three terrible pitches. Number one, it's not therapy, right? So your job is not to tell people that you're looking at your options and you've got a side hustle and all that sort of stuff, or that you're, you know, it's to deliver a great pitch every single time. Uh, number two, it's not your Wikipedia page. So you don't need to go back to where you started your career, you've got to really tune into what the other person's uh, interested in. And number three, pitch for what you want, not what you don't want. If you say, um, if you say I'm really, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, no one will give you referrals. If you say, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, no one will send business your way. So you have to pitch for what you want. You have to pitch powerfully. And it's, it's you know, one of my entrepreneurs said to me the other day, they said, oh, Oh, good news. I contacted a VC and the VC wants to catch up for a coffee and a chat. They said that it's informal and we're just going to have a little chat. And I said, bullshit, it's a pitch. Like you need to get, get really, really, really clear. You're not there for a coffee and a chat. You're there to pitch. The reason they described it as a coffee and a chat is so that they're not committed to doing anything with you if they don't want to, but you're there to pitch. So the default is no matter what, if someone's asking you, what do you do? You're you're there to give a great pitch. I'll give you an example of one that I found um, from one of my clients in Australia. Uh, I'm Susan Bryant, real, that's her real name. I'm a financial planner and the CEO of Seeds of Advice. For 25 years, I've been delivering financial strategies to rural families who own farms. I write uh, for the main farming newsletters and I speak for the Rural Women's Conference. I'm the co-author of Retire Inspire and I leave my clients with peace of mind and a plan to secure their farm for the next two generations. So really nice niche orientated pitch, leave, you know, talks about, you know, that, that's a great answer to the question, what do you do? If you want to photograph it, feel free to photograph it. And Susan will have all these people contacting her from the other side of the world. And she won't know what to do with herself. <clears throat> the next one is to publish. So publish is about ownership. It's about owning ideas. It's about getting market 
uh, acceptance that these are your ideas, this is your strategy, this is something you've put into the marketplace here. So as you can hear, I have an Australian accent. Um, in, we, we got taught Australian history in school and we got taught about the first settlers who came over to Australia and they claimed the land and the way they claimed the land was they put up a flag and then as soon as they had put up a flag, they created these little documents called transfer of ownership documents and they actually sliced up all the land and they would award people land as payment for things. So there was so much land, Australia is quite large, and, uh, and you'd get little title deeds for the land and people would come riding around on their horses and say, do you own this land? And you'd produce your title deed and they go, okay, carry on. And if you couldn't produce your title deed, you were deemed a swagman and you had to be thrown off because uh, you were on land that you didn't have a title deed for. So you had to have these title deeds to the land. So this was about proving ownership. Now, we live in an IP economy, intellectual property, an ideas economy, and you want to be able to do the same thing. You want to produce the title deed to your land. You want to produce ownership documents of this is my idea, this is what I'm all about. So the reason I write books is actually not because I care too much about book royalties or selling books or thinking of myself as an author. I want to show some ownership around ideas. I know how quickly ideas get copied and, and get moved and all that sort of stuff. I want to show when I originated that idea. I want to capture the idea. I want to document the idea. I want that sitting out there in the, in the, wor in the world. Um, and I also do it to clarify my thinking. So when you think about a title deed, it actually sh shows the boundaries of the land. So when you actually create a book, it shows the boundaries of your ideas. It shows you the parameters of what you're thinking. Uh, and it's powerful. So here's a key idea for you. The book that changes your life the most is not a book that you read, it's a book that you write. So th that, will, that will be such a transformational thing. The book goes out and wins you business. The book goes out and that does the job of a business development manager. For those that, of you that already employ people, a business development manager might cost you 40 grand a year in, in wages, plus eight grand to recruit them, plus eight grand to train them. You know, you're gonna spend a lot of money on business development managers, and then after two to three years, they're gonna get their confidence right up, and they're gonna do what? Leave, and you're gonna go through the whole process again. When you write a book, the coolest thing you can do is send out a 1,000 copies of the book and watch the business come rolling in. It used to be the case that authors promote their books, the new business model is that um, books promote the author and that you just give a thousand books away and watch how much business comes in. So uh, we've had a thousand clients or more do this strategy and it just never fails. Here's a few financial planning orientated ones. No fear retirement, how to enjoy a fun filled and fulfilling life when you retire. Um, the self-employed mortgage guide, the key to buying any property if you're self-employed. Um, the money plan, clear your debt, secure tomorrow and live for today. Um, cash rich, time rich. Uh, so all of these people are securing a little piece of land. The retirement compass, personal finance for the life you desire. So these are all great examples of people who've taken the time to write. Most of you, have, if you just recorded what you say in a typical week with your clients, if you used an app like Otter or Rev, um, and you just recorded the typical conversations that you're having with your clients, you would actually have 20,000 words of the book. You'd be halfway there, just in a week of recording what you, what you actually say to people. Um, the next one is to think in terms of product, not in terms of service. You do not want to be thinking in terms of selling time for money. What you want to do is think in terms of what we call an ascending transaction model. Ascending transaction model is you take your intellectual property, you take the ideas that came out when you wrote the book, and you put them into different products. And there's four types of products. There's gifts, uh, there's product for prospects, uh, which is the first sale, the first easy win uh, that you can deliver to someone. There's the core business, which is solving a, a problem in a full and remarkable way. And then there's the product for clients, which is the ongoing lifetime value of the client and the product that goes on. So if we have a look at um, Apple, Apple resurrected itself with this strategy. They gifted away iTunes um, and they made it available on PC. Uh, then most people went, oh, I really want one of those cool little iPod things. I personally, I remember the first time I saw that iPod, I instantly fell in love with it. I had to have one. Um, and, uh, and then once I had an iPod and my iPod was running with my PC, I thought, hmm, I really like the iPod. Maybe I could have a look at the Mac. I haven't had a look at a Mac for a while. And then I saw that magnet thing that was connected, you know, the power where you trip over it and it just magnetically disconnects. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then the guy says to me, 
do you know with an, with an apple, you don't have to shut it down. You just shut the lid and then it's like you can go, like, you don't have to shut it down. That's incredible. So I bought, bought one of those. Um, and then I went onto the App Store all the time and I bought music and movies and apps and all that stuff and Apple takes 30% of all of that revenue. So what you're seeing here is a gift into a product for prospects, a product prospects into a core business, core business into product for clients. For a smaller business, you're going to have podcasts and videos, you're going to have books and events, you're going to have elite trainings and mentorings. Those are the types of things that you might have. Here's a financial plan, a client of ours um, in Melbourne. I've deliberately chosen ones um, in other parts of the world just, just for keep it fair. Um, so this is Peter. Peter Ziggy decided that he would really go all in on the personal brand. So he rebranded his financial planning business around himself, peterziggy.com, um, and he created the 3P method. Um, and uh, he really built a personal brand here. He's got quite a team. He's got about 10 people on the team who do most of the functional work, but he does a lot of the um, out and about stuff. So you can go straight onto his website and start listening to his podcasts and his radio interviews. He hosts a radio show on a, on a small radio station, but he records it and he puts all that on the, um, on the website. He's got lots of videos, three big problems people face. His book is there. Why do I do what I do? You can download his media kit, his speaking kit. He gets paid to go and speak at conferences now. Um, and then you can see the ascending transaction model. <clears throat> He's got a monthly seminar that people book themselves into. Buying the book, these are product for prospects. Meeting with Ziggy is obviously discussing, discussing the core business. And, and once you've got, bought the core product, you then look at the product for clients. So he's really built his entire website around this strategy and the personal brand, the key person of influence brand. And his business has gone through the roof as a result of going from a faceless company brand that no one cared about to a personal brand that people are interested in. Um, the next one, profile. So this is very much what he's done. Key idea here, you are who Google says you are. If I'm going to transfer hundreds of thousands of pounds over to you and get you to help me and look after it, I'm going to Google you. Right? I'm going to check you out on Google. I'm going to have a look. Before I push send on that transfer, before I sign on the dotted line, these days, especially younger people, millennials and that sort of stuff, they are in the habit of Googling people before they do a big deal. Um, you might get away with some of the older clients who don't Google you first, but if, you know, most of the younger ones will definitely Google you. And the issue is, is three things will happen. On that front page of Google, you're either going to have a really positive response, right? It says lots of good things, and here's some photos of you speaking and some videos, and here's a, some different websites, and here you contribute to this publication, and it's all there, and you are who you said you are. Uh, or it's crickets, nothing. Like it's just, you know, it's a footballer in America, and it's like, really? This guy plays football in Tampa in Florida? Wow, that's amazing. Um, so it's confusing. Or there's that one or two negative reviews. You've got like some, someone who really took offense to something you said or did, and they gave you a one-star review on your Google page, and that turns someone off from doing business with you. So that drowns out all the positive because there's not much else on there. So you've got to build a great profile. So we say this idea, are you worth your salt? That's what Google's looking for. Salt is social media. So essentially having Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, all of those profiles done well could generate you a lot of business. You know, there's billion, two billion people a month on Facebook and a billion people a month on uh, Instagram. LinkedIn at the moment's got phenomenal organic reach. Lots of, you know, business people on there. Um, very few people uploading videos into LinkedIn, and yet you'll get five to 10,000 views if you stick a video on LinkedIn. Um, Twitter, great tool for listening and hearing other people's conversations and, and chiming in with some, some um, timely advice. Uh, the next one is awards. <clears throat> so G Google loves finding that you're an award-winning person. So um, awards and accreditations, anything like investors in people or um, if you've been featured on a particular list, all of that stuff ranks highly. We're really proud we recently got Investors in People gold. The cool thing about Investors in People is any business, if you've got three to 12 people, 
It costs you about 1,500 pounds to go through it. They'll talk to your whole team. They'll get you to define a vision, a mission, values, and a plan. It's really good stuff to do. And then at the end, they'll assess you and give you an investors in people rating. It's not one of those awards that only one company can win. Lots of companies can win it, provided you meet their standards. It's actually good value, and it's a good thing to do. I'd really encourage you to, to go through investors in people um, if, you, uh, if you can. Live events, big one, hosting workshops, hosting live events, um, positioning yourself with other key people of influence. Uh, we run events with like Tesla and the managing director of um, Tesla Europe and that kind of positions us alongside that Tesla brand. So you could find people in your industry who are really leading the conversation and bring them to the table and run events. You could speak at other people's events once you build a bit of a profile, but it all ends up on Google. You could host a TEDx. TEDx is an open source platform. You could do TEDx money, you could do TEDx millennials, you could do TEDx location. Right, so you can do a TEDx uh, event as well. Ends up on YouTube, ends up on Google. And traditional media, all traditional media is now digital. So essentially, if you get featured in Entrepreneur or GQ or uh, any of those types of things, you are straight to the front page of Google as well. Now, all of those magazines, they have their uh, core content in the magazine, but all of them now run very deep blogs covering huge amounts of content. Forbes, for example, has a little tiny magazine, but they have something like 1,500 UK contributors all writing blogs every month. Uh, you could become a Forbes contributor, you could talk to Forbes contributors, you could do a search on LinkedIn for all the Forbes contributors and just ping them a uh, message and say, can I contribute to one of your blogs or can I be interviewed for one of your blogs? So all of that's gonna end up on Google. Some of you hate the idea of being in the spotlight, you don't wanna be in the spotlight. Is anyone in that category? You're like, oh, I hate the idea of being in the spotlight. Oh, look at you all, you're like, no, I'm fine with it. Cool, most of you are like, give me the spotlight. Um, only a few people put their hand up that they don't like it. Key idea, if you don't like the idea of being in the spotlight, is don't think about it as being in the spotlight, think of it as becoming the spotlight. So the idea is not to say, look at me, it's to say, look at that. Don't look at me, look at these trends. Don't look at me, look at this um, new piece of newsworthy information that's out there. So really get in the habit of not making it about yourself, but making it about what, what you're talking about. Final one is partnerships. Getting good at structuring partnerships is a powerful strategy that key people of influence uh, are, are great at. And the three-way partnership that you want is brand product distribution. That's the magic partnership. So you'll see big companies doing this all the time. Smart entrepreneurs know that someone else already woke up with the money, the contacts, the fame, the know-how, the time, the credibility, all of that stuff is already out there. And it's about partnering with the people who already have it to bring it in under your umbrella as well. So this is how big companies structure their partnership. So Nike just sits in the middle and says, we'll get Roger Federer to lift our profile within tennis. We'll get Fruit of the Loom to create a tennis range of clothing and we'll give it to Walmart to go out and sell. So that's brand product distribution. You see Victoria's Secret, we'll get Miranda Kerr to be the model. We'll create the product through a, um, a, a, a uh, manufacturer, oh, by the way, just side note, do you know who is the manufacturer for Victoria's Secret? It's the weirdest thing, blow your mind when I tell you, they do it in the prison system in the USA, right? What a weird torture. Uh, <laughs> goodness, poor guys. Uh, and then distribution. Um, Nespresso, was started in 1976, and they did nothing until 2006, and they were just literally just kind of trying to get out there and sell into offices. And then they did the deal with George Clooney, and George Clooney elevated the brand. Everyone was like, wow, okay, George drinks this coffee, that's pretty cool, he lives in Lake Como, must know good coffee. And they got Megamix to redesign the product, and then they launched it exclusively with a special area in, uh, in Selfridges, and that totally transformed the brand. Between 2006 and 2016, they just went whew, up, up like a rocket. And then they got some negative publicity about the environmental impact of the product in 2016, and they've come, come off the boil, especially because George's brand is about ethics as well, so it flies in the face of the brand. But you can see that what built it was a good partnership of brand, product, and distribution. So you can go out and find products that you can sell, you can find brands that you can align to, you can find distribution that you can align to. So you wanna be thinking, how do you leverage these concepts? How do you, who could you align to that would elevate your brand? Who could you, what, what products could you add to your mix? 
Um, you might know an amazing business coach. Could you do a partnership to add business coaching to, as part of what you do through that partner? Um, distribution channels uh, as well, they're all already out there. So key people of influence are the organizing force and they use these four, five tools. They pitch, they publish content, they develop products, they raise their profile and their, the profile of their business and they go out there and do partnerships like, like what I've talked to you about. And that's the role of the key person of influence. And if you've got someone on your team doing that role, uh, away you go, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll take right off in the 2020s.